what exactly do the terms race and ethnicity refer to? Well, we all know that they describe people, and in some sense, they seem to imply some essential essence of who you are, whether you like it or not. Constantly, we are asked to check a box indicating our race slash ethnicity. So let's take a look at what those two words actually mean. The dictionary is a good place to begin. So let's look up the word race. According to the fifth edition of the Dictionary of Genetics, race is a phenotypically and or geographically distinctive subspecific group composed of individuals inhabiting a defined geographical and or ecological region and possessing characteristic phenotypic and gene frequencies that distinguish it from other such groups. The number of racial groups that one wishes to recognize within a species is usually arbitrary, but suitable for the purposes under investigation. See, subspecies. Okay, let's see subspecies. <laughs> subspecies, a taxonomically recognized subdivision of a species, geographically and or ecologically defined subdivisions of a species with distinctive characteristics. See, race. So, race and subspecies are two terms that mean the same thing. Well, these days, biologists don't much use the term race. It carries so much meaning now outside of biology that it has fallen out of favor. And so, subspecies is the term we use to designate the distinct populations within a polytypic species. Do you remember that term? Polytypic. It is a particularly useful concept in evolutionary biology. A species that is polytypic, that has multiple subspecies, has clear, distinct subdivisions that generally result from geographic or environmental isolation. Let's look at an example. A reindeer are a nice example. This map of North America shows the geographic ranges of six different subspecies, all within the, the species Rangifer tarandus. The photographs on the right give you a, a good sense of the phenotypic differences between the northernmost and the southernmost subspecies, from the coat color to the branching pattern of the antlers to the white neck tuft. You can tell one from the other. And in total, there are 14 subspecies of reindeer worldwide, and there are two that are now extinct. One of my favorites is the African is the wildcat. They are all within the genus and species Felis sylvestris, and within the species Sylvestris, there are five subspecies recognized. Very elusive kitties, for sure. <laughs> but I had the joy of living with a Felis sylvestris libica for a while. Ooh, geez, was he a destructive thing. He was kind of a jerk. He would go up and just, like, knock stuff off of shelves, like, really intentionally while he's looking at you, like, poof. Oh, he did it with a bottle of wine once. Such a mess. <laughs> anyway. So, Felis sylvestris, they tend towards the larger sides um, being the larger size of a domestic cat. And for the Felis sylvestris libica, um, they have longer legs, as you can see in the lower left photograph. And these are from the equatorial regions. Um, so these are, as you can see, there's beautiful cats with quite a bit of variation in their pelage, from the length and thickness of their fur to the coloring of the fur coat. The cats in more temperate regions, <coughs> higher latitudes, tend to be darker in color, and their body shape also varies geographically, reflecting the patterns you would expect with Allen's, um, Allen's rule. Again, noting the long legs of Libica, one of the African wildcats. The gray wolf, though, might be an even better example. This map shows the geographic distributions of 14 subspecies within Canis lupus. So if you pause this video and you look closely, or just look really closely while I talk, you'll notice that the larger subspecies tend to be in the more northern, colder regions, as you would expect given Bergman's rule. 
And you'll also notice that the wolves that have more white and whitish gray or whitish brown fur are also found in the Arctic or subarctic regions, corresponding to landscapes that have more snow cover during the You learned about allopatric speciation in Module 5, Experience 4 to be exact. Now in this type of speciation, a population experiences vicariance, meaning that a geographic or environmental feature interrupts gene flow within the population. So for example, a river may change course and, and separate individuals on one side of the river from individuals on the other side. As I've illustrated here, hopefully you can see that I've illustrated it here with the, the blue line <laughs> going through the middle of the rectangle. So we're watching, looking at time um, is moving forward as you go down the slide from top to bottom. Now assuming these creatures, these dots as I've represented them, assuming that these dots can't cross the river, the populations genetically start to diverge as they no longer have the gene flow that would hold them together in terms of allelic frequencies, in terms of allele frequencies. Alleles can be lost in one population with no renewal from the other, and new alleles can arise in one population that pushes them even further apart in terms of their allelic variation. I represented that phenomena by showing dots on one side of the river turning gray as time passes. And now let's consider what happens when that river is no longer an obstacle. Perhaps it changed course again or was dammed upstream. What happens when the gray dots and the white dots meet back up? There are just two options. One, they recognize each other as potential mates. Um, sort of like these two here, meeting across the skinny little river and going, hmm, well, hello. <laughs> they mate, they hybridize, bringing the allele frequencies of the two populations back in line, and speciation does not happen. Alternatively, they don't end up mating. I'm catching up, I'm catching up. <laughs> the two dot populations may have diverged um, so much, um, they may have diverged too much to come back together. Their gene pools have separated, they're in isolation, and speciation has occurred. So when they run into each other across the tiny little skinny stream that used to be a river, they go, ah, what are you? <laughs> so. There are two ways that this speciation, this isolation can happen. The isolation, isolating mechanisms can be pre-mating or they can be post-mating mechanisms. So examples of, uh, of pre-mating isolation are things like time of activity. Maybe the gray dots are active only in the evening and white dots are active only in the morning. They don't ever cross paths. Or maybe they're active at the same time of day, but they have different mating calls or different mating dances, and so they don't find each other attractive. Or perhaps they do find each other attractive, but mm, the parts don't work together anymore. Maybe they can't actually copulate, or when they do, the sperm can't access and fertilize the egg. A post-mating isolation refers to an incompatibility between sperm and egg. They can come together and fertilize, but the zygote doesn't develop properly. Or, um, the hybrid offspring isn't viable. Maybe an embryo can form, but it has reduced viability. Or perhaps the embryo forms and the offspring is fine, but sterile. For example, mules. Mules are a cross between a female horse and a male donkey. The animal itself is fine, but it can't reproduce. That's a form of post-mating isolation. Let's consider a real-world example. So rather than gray and white dots, <laughs> let's look at baboons. Here, you're looking at a photograph of a female baboon with her baby riding on her back. <laughs> I absolutely love this image. These, these, this image of the mama and her, the baby on her back. <laughs> it's been hypothesized, actually, that the way the baboon um, the way that a baboon's tail, like, it goes up like that, 
is actually to help the baby stay on its mama's back. <laughs> I don't know about that. But the babies really do ride on their mamas like this all the time. And it's really cute. <laughs> anyway, let's go back to thinking about subspecies. Because baboons are the classic example of a polytypic species within primates. Baboons are found all across sub-Saharan Africa. There are six different types of baboons, and you can pretty easily tell them apart. You have olive baboons in, an, in the northern part of the range. They have an olivey brown color to their fur. You have homodryas baboons up in the northeast corner, in the northeast part of their range. They have, a, they, um, have fur that's light gray, and they have this spectacular mane. Um, Cynocephalus baboons are more yellowy in color with white bellies, etc., etc. It goes on and on. These illustrations that are on this map, you can they give you a good sense of how the fur varies, the pelage differs across the different types of baboons. So baboons also have some really interesting behavioral differences too. Anubis baboons live in multi-male and multi-female groups, but Homodryas baboons they live in what we call harems. So one adult male baboon lives with multiple females, and he guards his control over their reprodu reproduction with ferocity. Kind of like gorillas, which we, are, we talked about before. And the super interesting thing about these baboons is that they will interbreed with each other at their contact zones. On this map, you can see three black X's. These indicate three of the most studied hybrid zones that we know of. Anubis baboons and Homodryas baboons mix together in Ethiopia. Anubis and Cynocephalus mix in Tanzania. And Kinde and Ursinus hybridize in Zambia. So as a taxonomist, do you think that we should call these separate species or are they all one species? This is debated quite a bit in primatology. When I first started out in my professional career, we called these different baboons subspecies of Papiohomodryas. We followed the biological species concept. Since they can and do mate in the wild, they are members of the same species. All of them are Papiohomodryas, and we recognize their differences at the subspecific, at the subspecies level. But these days, it's more common to recognize these six different types as separate species, following more of an evolutionary species concept. We can tell them apart, and so we call them different species. As we talked about at the beginning of the semester, taxonomic names are subjective. The scientist decides how to draw the boundaries between taxa. So the answer to the question, are baboons Papiohomodryas with six subspecies, or six different species of papio? Mm. The answer is really just an educated opinion. But the really clear phenomenon that underlies the variation in baboons is that there are different types of baboons. No scientist disagrees about these categories, the boundaries to the categories, which baboon belongs in which category. We only disagree over the taxonomic level of recognition. And we all also agree that in perhaps 100,000 years, these categories might truly be distinct species at the biological species concept with no hybridization possible. Or they could perhaps completely reconnect by gene, gene flow and all of these differences could basically go away. The divisions that we see here, these subspecies, if you will, they are incipient species. Incipient species. It's important to keep in mind that the subspecies designation implies a deep genetic differentiation, a, a precursor to speciation. These populations are on the verge of speciating they aren't quite there yet. It could go either way. So when we apply terms like race 
another word for subspecies, to human biological variation. We are denoting significant biological meaning. Incipient species within the species Homo sapiens. So we have looked at the genomic variation of humans around the world, and this is what we see. This admixture map and all of the others that we have looked at this semester, they show conclusively that humans do not have distinct subdivisions like baboons. <laughs> there are not incipient species, there are not subspecies within Homo sapiens. We're all one species with no delineation based on geographic or environmental barriers that have been consistent over long spans of time. Over the last half million years, due to migration and gene flow, populations ebb and flow, diverge and come back together. The idea of biologically meaningful subdivisions in our species, though, it's, it's deeply embedded in Western thought. Now, one of my most favorite books is Mammals of the World. Now, when I was in graduate school, I used to, to trot down the hall to my advisor's office to borrow his copy of this. And I did it so often that he explicitly, um, he took me aside one day and told me that I really needed to buy my own copy. So I did, <laughs> of course. And this is a, an inventory of all the living mammal species. It's a really simple book, but so rich with detail and information. I actually have another one that is just focused on the primates, um, which it's gone, I take it with me to uh, um, on museum research trips, um, despite how heavy it is. <laughs> and it's and it's that interesting <laughs> um, and valuable as a research tool. And actually my graduate students um, who were with me on a, on a recent trip recent pre-pandemic trip to Ethiopia to work in the museum there, um, they all referred to it as the, the magic book. <laughs> We'd always turn to the magic book <laughs> for entertainment. Okay, but let's, let's turn to um, Mammals of the World and see what it says about humans. Homo sapiens. The average man is 163 to 172 centimeters in height, weighs about 75 kilograms. Females average 52 kgs. The pelage is sparse, usually of one color. They have a dental formula of two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars in the adult, and they have a deciduous dentition. That there are four or five possible geographic races. Oh, so frustrating. Why does this amazing inventory of mammals include these possible geographic races? when biological research clearly show that they don't exist? Well, because these categories have been around since the very beginning of our classificatory system. Let's go back to Linnaeus. Now, Linnaeus never, he never traveled the world, he never explicitly studied human variation, but he heard stories from European explorers about what people elsewhere in the world were like. And based on that armchair knowledge, he divided our species into these categories. Americanus, Europius, Asiaticus, Afar. He did it by continent. Now remember, taxonomy is a hypothesis about how a group of animals could or should be categorized. He hypothesized that humans have these four categories. He also included, <laughs> with assumed equal validity, categories for um, monstrosus, which is the equivalent of Bigfoot, and also ferris, which refers to children who were raised by wolves. Seriously. <laughs> so think about that for a moment. The biological categories that a guy devised while sitting in his house 250 years ago still form the basis of how we view the variation in our species today. We have changed a lot of our scientific views since then. 
We replaced the miasma theory of disease with the germ theory of disease. We significantly updated our thinking on gravity since Isaac Newton, thanks to Einstein. We replaced a static view of biology with evolution. It is a time to update Linnaeus's categories. These racial groups don't exist in humans. The hypothesis that we have Asiaticus and Ferris and Europius and Mon Monstrosus, science has rejected those hypotheses time and time again. This is why scientists keep saying that race isn't real. Neither are wolf children, or Bigfoot for that matter. Although I'm gonna guess that some of you might want to debate me about Bigfoot. <laughs> Okay, so we have settled the definition of race as being an outdated term meaning subspecies. And what about ethnic group? Is ethnic group race? No. Ethnicity specifically refers to a group of people who share the same language and customs and who identify with certain recent origins. This is a cultural phenomenon. Since culture is passed from parent to child, there is an association between ethnicity and a person's ancestry, but that doesn't have to be the case. There are lots of examples of a person's, um, of, there are lots of examples of people who are, have adopted a different culture. They're adopted into it as, either as children or who choose as an adult to live in a different culture from their childhood. My dad's great-grandfather, my my great-grandfather, he migrated from Russia to the United States and started working as a barber for coal miners in West Virginia. Now, from what my family can tell me, he appears to have rarely spoken Russian or practiced his Russian cultural heritage ever again. What, then, is his ethnicity? Well, we let my great-grandfather tell us his ethnicity. And as for his race, well, we know he's human, and humans don't have any subspecies. But a Linnaean-influenced view of human biology in the United States, people would look at him and call him Caucasian, or white, or European, or Eastern European, or some slur for people from Eastern European, uh, from Eastern Europe, as was written in the logbook at Ellis Island on the day he first arrived from the United States. Take your pick. <laughs> 